All right, let's continue talking about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination, but this time let's focus on sexism. Let's first start by comparing sexism with what we've learned about racism. As with racism, blatant displays of overt sexism are less socially acceptable nowadays. Society just simply won't tolerate it. So researchers now need to look a little bit more closely at things like modern sexism, kind of like modern racism, and implicit sexism, just like implicit stereotyping and implicit racism. So now there are even IATs, that implicit association test that we talked about previously, specifically geared toward measuring sexism. Now here's where a difference comes into play that's kind of interesting. Unlike racial stereotypes, gender stereotypes are prescriptive rather than merely descriptive. Let me explain what I mean by that. When I'm talking about prescriptive stereotypes, it means that these stereotypes are indicating what people in society believe men and women should be like, what types of traits they should have. And you can compare that with some other stereotypes that exist that are not prescriptive. Like, so for example, there might be a stereotype that gays are artistic, but we in society don't feel that gays should be artistic. So that is not a prescriptive stereotype. But in our society, there is a stereotype that women are loving and nurturing, and we do as a society believe that women should be nurturing and loving. So that's what I mean by a prescriptive stereotype. So that's one interesting little difference. Now, here's another difference. Unlike the races, the sexes actually interact quite regularly. So think about it. You know, we're very familiar with each other. Um, we're related to one another in families. You know, we're friends with one another. Um, lovers, of course, people have long-term and short-term um, sexual relationships. So we interact with the sexes, the sexes interact with each other on a much different level than the races interact with each other in our society. And as a result, there's this larger mix, really, of positive and negative feelings and beliefs between the sexes than is typical of racism. And it's that mix, it's that duality, it's that complexity that is the basis for ambivalent sexism. And we're going to talk about that next. First, let's talk about that word ambivalent. What does that mean? In general, it refers to mixed feelings or beliefs or even contradictory feelings and beliefs about something or someone, you know, like women in general. And in general, women's stereotypes are more positive than men's stereotypes. But this is where it's interesting. Those relatively positive stereotypes tend to be on traits that we value less for success, the way that we often measure success in our society, like economically, um, through one's career, through the business world. So when I talk about traits that we value less in those domains, I'm talking about things like um, being warm or nurturing or patient. Those are stereotypes that are associated with women. They tend to be positive, but again, they tend to be valued less. So this suggests that we are, to some extent in our society, ambivalent when it comes to women. We have those mixed feelings. All right, well, with that in mind, let's focus now on ambivalent sexism specifically. Ambivalent sexism is characterized by two somewhat different types of sexism. One is based on negative and resentful feelings and beliefs that men have toward women. But while at the same time these men often have affectionate feelings, um, maybe they engage in chivalrous behaviors, which are sometimes kind of patronizing, those feelings and beliefs toward women you can see seem somewhat positive. Well, let, let's label each of these and talk about them in more detail. When it comes to that first type of sexism, we call that hostile sexism. And hostile sexism is based quite a bit on this belief that men might have, that women are trying to control them. And they're trying to control them through a few different means. One would be just by simply trying to push a feminist ideology. For example, where women are pushing um, equal rights for themselves. The other might be that women are trying to control men through their sexuality. They have quite a bit of power that way, and men come to resent that. Now, the second type of sexism is often known as benevolent sexism. And benevolent sexism is based on a, a chivalrous attitude, kind of a gentlemanly attitude toward women that does seem favorable on the face of it, 
But it can be sexist because it assumes that women are weak and it assumes that women are in need of a man's protection and assistance. Let me give you a couple examples. So a man might believe that women need a man around for the family uh, to make tough decisions, to fix problems, to pay the bills, for example. You can see how that's somewhat patronizing. Um, another form of benevolent sexism would be that women should forego their careers uh, because they're better at taking care of children, and that's what they should be focusing their attention on. So on the face of it, it seems like there's this negative and this positive aspect to it, and there are some positive aspects, but even the positive aspects have a patronizing tone to them and are somewhat sexist. What's interesting is that these two forms of sexism tend to be positively related. So men who agree with or have uh, hostile sexist attitudes tend to also engage in benevolent sexist behaviors. So they're positively correlated. So what causes ambivalent sexism? Well, the researchers who have studied this quite a bit have a few theories about what's going on. And in general, they think that this might arise from two basic facts about relationships between women and men. One is that men in general tend to be more dominant in society. And the other is that there is still this interdependence, though, between men and women. So let, let's look at each one of those individually for a second. Men do tend to dominate across cultures. That's pretty easy to see. And hostile sexism tends to arise in large part because dominant groups naturally tend to view other groups as somewhat inferior. So we can see where the hostile sexism tends to come from. But of course, despite their male dominance, men are often really highly dependent upon women because of all the roles that they serve. They serve roles as wives, as mothers, as romantic partners. And this dependence that men have on women fosters that benevolent type of sexism where men see women also as valuable and attractive. I think this graphic right here sums up pretty well how hostile sexists and benevolent sexists might feel and act in a variety of different situations. All right, let's talk a little bit about objectification. I think this is probably relatively obvious, but women are often viewed and treated more as mere bodies or objects and less as you know fully functioning, autonomous, valuable human beings. This really stuck out to me after I saw a commercial years and years ago, and I think it was during a Super Bowl, when I saw Bob Dole, who is a, a former U.S. senator, um, very highly respected. At some point, he ran for president. And uh, he went on TV and he talked about how he has erectile dysfunction. And he was saying it takes courage, but you should see your doctor about erectile dysfunction because there are treatments. And this was really one of the first Viagra commercials. And I remember being pretty impressed by it. Now, here's why I'm talking about this with objectification. And that's because this whole idea of treating erectile dysfunction went from being courageous yourself um, and as a man taking responsibility you know, for your own body and it really kind of put it on women to sell the product in the future. So now when you look at a Viagra commercial, what you're typically seeing is a woman where this person is saying like, hey guys, if you have erectile dysfunction, see your doctor so that you can have me as the prize. And of course, we can see commercials with all different types of women in almost any situation you can think of. Now this whole objectification thing is much less of a problem for men, but Ben Stiller though, he did put together a spoof of a Viagra ad just to kind of show how silly it is um, the way we objectify women in those ads. So that's just an example. Now, keep in mind this objectification that we see quite often in our culture has consequences. And because of that objectification, it can often lead to negative effects on women, uh, both in their mental and physical health. And it's usually because of some form of stress. It can lead to problems with academic performance, with social interactions. I mentioned that stress seems to be a key component here. And that's because as women are overly valued in our culture for their beauty, it can lead to some stressful situations. So for example, it's tough for women to trust people 
who they think like them simply because of their beauty, because they know it's a superficial thing and they know it's not necessarily long lasting. And that leads to the, the other really stressful component. It's very hard to maintain such high standards and expectations that society has. I mean, beauty only lasts physically for so long. So it's a losing battle. And of course, that's stressful. Let's finish up by talking about this section on sex discrimination and specifically double standards. Let's start with this great example. And this is an example of double standards that's based on a research study. So we have some empirical evidence of a double standard. This is all the way back in the 1960s. A researcher named Philip Goldberg worked on this. And what he did was uh, he enlisted the help of some research subjects. These were all female college students. And they were asked to evaluate writing samples, some articles that were supposedly written by one of two people, either John McKay or Joan McKay. So these women, young college students, were all reading the exact same material, but they believed it was written either by a man or a woman, and they were asked to evaluate those writing samples. Well, as you would expect, they gave higher evaluations, higher ratings when they thought the samples were written by men. So that was really kind of dejecting because it made people start to wonder, are women also prejudiced against women? And the findings were really very clear. Even women were somewhat prejudiced against women. Now, nowadays, when that type of study is um, replicated, we tend not to see performance evaluations that are quite so biased. So that type of bias that we saw in the past doesn't seem to be existing as, as it was. But it's, it's pretty clear that worldwide sex discrimination continues to exist particularly in other parts of the world. Let me give you a couple examples. Some of these examples are based on restrictive laws. So think about like in Yemen. In Yemen, a woman is not recognized as a full person before a court of law. And if a single woman is offering testimony, it's only taken seriously if it's backed up by a man's testimony. Uh, in Vatican City, women still can't vote. In Saudi Arabia, women can't drive. And one really sad statement uh, is coming out of Morocco, and that's that judges have the ability in those situations to force victims of rape to marry their rapists, because apparently if the rapist and the victim marry, that nullifies the crime. So these are just some really extreme examples to show that double standards still exist, sexual discrimination still exist. Think about gender-based abortions. There are some families that want a boy so bad to carry on the family name, particularly in countries where they're limited in terms of the number of babies they're allowed to have, where they'll find out the gender of the baby and they will abort that baby if it's a girl. So these are some really extreme examples, but I think it's important that we remind ourselves that this type of discrimination still exists. Now, some of the discrimination that exists is on a more everyday level. So let's talk a little bit about work roles. Take a look at this graphic. It's really kind of interesting. We can see that women, percentage-wise, are more heavily, heavily represented in a variety of careers that are more service-oriented, and service-oriented positions often pay a lot less. So we're talking about positions like teachers, social workers, um, meeting and event planners, people who are making clothes. Psychologists is in that as well. Psychologists get play, uh, paid pretty well. Um, hotel clerks, a variety of service sector jobs. Women tend to be more represented. But now look at the types of positions where women are much less represented. We're talking about careers that make a lot more money, have a lot more prestige. Computer systems analysts, physicians and surgeons, lawyers, chief executives. These are some pretty high level and high paying positions. It's kind of interesting, look at this one as well, chefs and head cooks. Who does the most cooking in our society? If you were to look overall day to day, it's got to be women because we know that that type of duty is more likely to be put on the shoulders of wives and mothers. But that's something that we don't value a lot in our society. So when it comes to people who cook, who make a lot of money and are held in high prestige, we're talking about people who are chefs and head cooks and they're more likely to be men. Well, that sex discrimination, when it comes to people's work roles and career paths, often start pretty early during those school years. I can think of an example that exists within my own family. 
when I was young, um, we're talking about like junior high and high school, and my sister was about the same age, I remember my dad being very clear that when we were able to pick the classes, my dad was saying it's very important for me that I take a lot of math classes. And I didn't exactly know why at the time, but he just thought it would be very important for me. And look at where that took me. Although I teach social psychology and other psychology classes, the psych classes that I teach the most often are statistics classes. So obviously I picked a career that kind of coincides more stereotypically with my gender. Now, what did my dad suggest that my sister take? Typing. He thought that was going to be very important to her future career because what was he seeing for her? He was seeing that she would be a secretary. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a secretary, but the whole point is he didn't have the same lofty goals for her that he had for me. There is some somewhat good news that comes from this. There's some research to show that women who act in a masculine way are often seen as more competent. Because keep in mind, even when women and men have the same jobs, there are often glass ceilings that exist. It's hard for them to get promotions. And of course, we see large discrepancies in their pay. So women who act masculine, you know, they tend to be uh, somewhat gruff, uh, not necessarily as friendly. They don't smile as often. Um, they are seen as somewhat more competent, but there's a downside as well. They're seen as less attractive, less likable, and less socially skilled. So it really is a double-edged sword. Sorry, ladies. When I think about this, I, I guess I'll just throw in my two cents. I have found that women in general um, can be and are very successful in this unfair world when they simply try to be themselves and they try to be the best person who they actually are, but at the same time remain completely committed to being competent in their professions and tough and persistent. So take that for what it's worth. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.